This video was brought to you by Brilliant. For as long as most of our viewers have been alive, Italy has had a reputation as Europe's economic basket case. National debt has been running above 100% of GDP since the 90s, and Italy always seems to be struggling with a political crisis, an economic crisis, or both. However, in the past few years, things have quietly turned round. Italy has seen better post-pandemic growth and lower inflation than Germany, France, and the UK. And while it's still high as a percentage of GDP, Italy's debt currently looks remarkably manageable. So in this video, we're going to take a look at why Italy's economy is doing surprisingly well, and ask whether the good times can last. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So, to understand Italy's economic woes, you really need to go back to the 80s. Like many other European countries, Italy's economy struggled in the 70s, as rising oil prices in the aftermath of the Arab-Israeli war put pressure on living standards and stoked inflation. However, unlike other European economies, including Britain, Italy's economy rapidly recovered in the 80s, at least when measured by GDP. At the time, this was attributed to a whole load of things. Some people credited the Italian central bank, which had stopped financing government borrowing, i.e. printing money, while others credited the government for putting an end to wage indexation policies, which basically guaranteed worker salary increases if inflation went too high, and created an inflation-inducing wage price spiral. International commentators often credited Italy's small and medium-sized businesses, or SMEs, which enjoyed an export boom in the 80s. These SMEs mostly produced artisanal stuff like clothing, furniture and textiles, but there was a lot of demand for Italian goods internationally, and they came to be seen as the backbone of Italy's economy. Even today, Italy's economy is dominated by SMEs, and almost half of Italians work in companies with fewer than 10 employees, the highest share in Europe after Greece. Anyway, at the time, commentators were writing articles about how the agility of Italian SMEs gave them a competitive edge over lumbering American corporations. This might sound ridiculous today, but Italy's economy really was booming. In fact, in 1987, Italy's statistical authority claimed that its GDP per capita had actually overtaken that of the UK, making Italy the fifth richest economy in the world after the US, Japan, Germany and France. The Italians were so smug about this that they even came up with a name for it, Il Sorpasso, or The Overtaking. However, with the advantage of hindsight, this Italian boom in the 80s looks more like a bubble. For starters, some of Italy's apparent growth came from adjustments made by the statistical authority in an attempt to include the black market in GDP figures, which is why Italy's GDP apparently jumped by 18% in 1986. But more importantly, a lot of Italy's growth during this period was driven by unsustainable government borrowing. National debt ballooned from 59% of GDP in 1980 to 123% at the end of 1994, more than double that of France and Germany. And, well, this debt accumulated in the 80s is basically the primary cause of Italy's long-standing economic woes. In part because borrowing costs were just higher back then, Italy has struggled to service this debt, i.e. pay off the interest, ever since. As a percentage of GDP, Italy's debt servicing costs rose from basically nothing in 1970 to 4% of GDP in 1980, and then about 10% in 1990. It's hard to articulate quite how insane this is. 10% of GDP is like five times a NATO country's defence budget, or more than Italy's entire public health care budget. While that number has since stabilised at about 4%, that's still double the OECD average. In fact, if you exclude debt servicing costs, Italy has actually run some of the biggest budget surpluses in Europe, thanks to eye-watering cuts to public services. Unfortunately for ordinary Italians, this austerity hasn't really worked, and Italian growth has been stagnant ever since, so neither its debt nor its servicing costs really declined that much relative to GDP. However, in the past few years or so, Italy's economy has suddenly started showing tentative signs of strength. According to data from the Federal Reserve, Italy has enjoyed a better post-COVID recovery than every other G7 economy in Europe, with GDP increasing by 4.2% since the end of 2019, compared to 1.9% in France, 1% in the UK, and just 0.1% in Germany. Inflation has also come down particularly fast in Italy since late last year, and is currently running at just 0.75%, 
compared to 2.5% in Germany and 2.9% in France. At the same time, while Italy's debt burden is still pretty massive by international standards, it's fallen remarkably fast since the pandemic, going from 155% of GDP in 2020 to 137% in 2023. This is in part because, despite an uptick in interest rates, better debt management has kept debt servicing costs steady at about 4% of GDP. So why is Italy's economy doing so well? Well, Italy's relatively low inflation rate is largely down to energy prices. Italy wasn't as affected as, say, Germany by the Ukraine-related disruption to Russian energy imports, and last month Italian energy prices fell by about 11%. Italy's GDP has also been helped by the return of tourism post-pandemic, but it's also because Italian exports have held up relatively well despite the global economic slowdown, rising by 5% in 2023. Italy actually has the second largest manufacturing sector in Europe after Germany, and usually runs a trade surplus representing about 3% of GDP, making it the third largest exporter in Europe after Germany and France. Italian GDP has also been boosted by the new Super Bonus, a generous tax relief on home improvements introduced in 2020. This policy has triggered a boom in Italian property and construction, but it's expensive and is one of the reasons Italy ran a pretty enormous deficit of 7.2% of GDP last year. Nonetheless, this isn't as bad as it sounds. National debt still fell as a percentage of GDP, in part because inflation ate away at some of Italy's debt, but also because Italy's borrowing costs are actually pretty low. In fact, the spread between Italian and German borrowing costs, which is economists' go-to proxy for measuring market confidence in Italy, is at its lowest since 2016, if we exclude the pandemic. This is in part because Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney has signalled her intent to keep the deficit relatively low, but also because markets apparently think the EU is slowly but surely moving towards a deeper fiscal union. Now, to be clear, we're not saying that everything is perfect. Italy is still struggling with an acute demographic crisis, its debt-to-GDP level is still unsustainably high, and its population is still undereducated and underemployed. These are all long-standing problems that no Italian government in the past 30 years has been able to fully resolve, and Maloney has a gargantuan challenge on her hands. Nonetheless, as things stand, Italy's economy is looking remarkably resilient, which is especially impressive given the various headwinds affecting European economies at the moment. A lot of the stuff we talk about at TLDR can seem pretty complicated, especially when we dive deep into economics and detailed data, which is why we use Brilliant.org to keep us sharp. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in maths, data analysis, programming, and AI. Brilliant is a learning platform designed to be uniquely effective. Their first principles approach helps you build understanding from the ground up, which is also how we structure TLDR videos. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with concepts, a method proven to be six times more effective than just watching lectures. Plus, all content on Brilliant is crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, Google, and more. Brilliant helps build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not memorizing. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also be becoming a better thinker. Learning a little every day is one of the most important things you can do, both for personal and professional growth. Brilliant helps you build real knowledge in just minutes a day, with fun lessons you can do whenever you have time. It's the opposite of mindless scrolling. Brilliant recently launched a ton of new content in data, all of which uses real-world data to train you to see trends and make better informed decisions, something politicians could really learn from. Anyway, these are for learners of any level to start or continue learning data analysis with a fully built out suite of new content, from Bayes' theorem to multiple linear regression. And you can truly learn by doing, as you'll be working with real data sets from sources like Starbucks, Twitter, Spotify, and more. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching and thanks to Brilliant for their support of TLDR.